Okay, so I have got a piece of pink ivory here that I've had lurking for ages. It's about 63 mil square. And I'll cut a section that's about 80 mil long to allow me enough room to fiddle about with it. This is going to be the centre of a, another Christmas bauble. Um, I've allowed enough length either end for me to put it between centres so that it can be turned this way. Uh, and the intention now is to drill a hole through here for the forstner on the pillar drill and a hole through there for the forstner on the pillar drill uh, and turn it between centres into a sphere and then put a finial on either end. Okay, so I've now pop marked it with my clicker pen marker on all corners. I'm now going off to the pillar drill. Okay, so I now um, drill the holes. Uh, I had to go all the way through on the one side, which popped out the bottom uh, on there, a little bit of ragging. Uh, the other side, I had to drill half and then half because the Forstner was having difficulty going right the way through because of the bounce on the curved inside there. So I'm now just going to drill a small hole uh, at either end, which will be ready to take the finial. So a quick measure of the tip of the uh, crown step drive shows me that that's a five millimeter diameter. So that's the hole size that I'm going to drill at either end. So it's now mounted between centres with a Crown Evolution step drive, the headstock and a down leash, a long nose, a tail stock centre just to give it some good support whilst I turn it around. So now I've got a bit of the shaping done, I'm going to turn a tenon and pop it into the chuck. I decided at this point to also uh, give myself a little peg at either end uh, so that I've got a, um, a, a tenon that could sock it into the finials as well as the hole for the dowel from the finial. Then a quick sand up and a spray with cellular sanding sealer followed by a coat or two of uh, chestnuts um, acrylic gloss. And once it's dry after a little bit of heat gun work, uh, part it off. And then making sure I've caught that one, uh, ready to start making the finials. Right, I've got some African blackwood, which I just put between centres. I'm just going to round it off and turn a small tenon with a small medium sized record power chuck jaws. Blank is only just big enough to uh, allow me to put the tenon on and still have some support on the face of the jaws. I decided to uh, turn the other piece of blackwood, which is for the finial at the other end, to turn that around at the same time to save me messing about with the chuck jaws. I'm going to try and do a Cindy Drosler style um, finial for this end, uh, which will therefore require me to reduce the diameter of the main body for the central onion uh, bulb uh, to smaller than the base. African blackwood is so hard and it sort of chips rather than actually comes off in shavings. Uh, and it blunts your tool very quickly. At this point I stopped and had a thought uh, that I've actually designed my 
central sphere to have a uh, a peg that will go into a recess in the finial, which I have not made. So I'm going to have to take out the part turn piece and figure out a way of actually having a rebate made into the base. So I've taken the piece out and mounted it in the chuck jaws. Fortunately the taper uh, gets a really good grip on the central um, part of the chuck jaws so I've got a really good solid grip. So I'm very gently now because again this black wood is extremely hard very gently using the uh, parting tool to create a recess of the 18 millimeters that I needed to be to uh, allow the um, finial to dowel into it. Right, I marked where jaws one and two were. So back to shaping the finial we go. So I've just marked out where the bottom of the onion uh, bulb will be and uh, I'm now trying to profile it down and try and get that lovely sweeping elegant profile that Cindy Droza manages to get seemingly effortlessly. Just using a big skew and a small uh, six mil skew uh, to shape the profile at the bottom and at the tip and then uh, back to my spindle gouge just paring it right the way down very gently until the uh, nub could be parted off and the end of the spindle is freed up. A bit of one-handed skew work takes a bit of getting used to to do this uh, but once you've kind of figured out where to tuck the skew handle under your arm uh, it's actually not too bad. Then a bit more finessing of the tip of the finial with the spindle gouge, getting it as small as possible. At this point I've got to start uh, giving the uh, whole piece some support with my other hand so that the push from the spindle <clears throat> and the resistance from your hand balance each, each other up. So there's really no lateral force on the finial itself. Uh, gets trickier uh, as you get thinner of course. The traditional tool rest I find difficult to get my hand around and underneath in order to provide lateral support to the uh, spindle. So I've changed it to the uh, steel rod style uh, Axminster's tool rest and you can get your hand around and underneath it and just uh, get that resistance that you need from your uh, index finger on your left hand. It does take a while in the blackwood because it is so hard and it also takes a bit of getting used to using the spindle gouge one-handed. Again you kind of have to lay it along your arm so that it becomes like an extension of your finger effectively. Uh, but uh, again practice makes perfect. I haven't done that many. I'm getting better. Getting it thin still tricky. And then I'm going to try being a good boy and try and sand and finish as I go and try and avoid going back so that uh, you have got the strength of the main body of the finial there when you're finishing it off. Um, sand it all the way up to 400 grit using um, some Nyweb and then Yorkshire grit to finish it off and bring out that real sheen that you get from the blackwood. And then back to shaping the finial. Uh, you can see that the uh, wood has relaxed, the stresses have moved the tip about. Uh, you've got to expect that, that's one of the reasons why you try and avoid going back because it's not going to be running completely true after a while. As you get thinner and you get closer to the finished thickness, the support from your hand is even more important. And uh, either wrapping it around the tool rest seems to work, but sometimes I find just leaning over with my left arm resting on the top of the, uh, the pulley belt works okay too. Using a baby skew uh, can help quite a lot because uh, it's much harder to get a catch because you've got a much smaller area of the bevel and you can almost 
turn it wherever you like. You don't have to worry quite so much about the bottom third. You still have to be careful, but it's uh, a lot easier to get into the into the corners of the swing, particularly if it's one hand that you're using. And then sand up, because uh, that's, that's that piece finished. Don't forget to support it when you're sanding it. You don't want to snap it at this stage. Start at 180 in my case, uh, up to 400, and then Yorkshire grit again to, to burnish it. And then now to finish the base piece. A nice sweeping profile, getting it quite nice and thin underneath the onion. Now I've got to leave enough space for the absolute bottom to have a little uh, re reverse on it that I'm doing there. Uh, so I'm just using the thin parting tool, uh, going in at an angle. Gosh, you can see the way that's wobbling. Um, going in at an angle and hoping that I can get enough convex, concave shape. Uh, to match the sphere. Yeah. Right, well that's the top part of the finial uh, finished um, and I've just got to now do the other end which is going to be physically the top because it will be hanging from this. So I've learnt my lesson this time and uh, now I'm ready to um, drill the 18mm diameter hole using a Forstner. So I'm doing that first before I actually mount it properly in the chuck. This is going to be a simpler onion skin. It's going to have a much shorter um, uh, shank to it. It'll still come to a bit of a tip, but the tip will have to be fairly blunt because it's got to have a um, uh, an eyelet screwed into it so you don't want it splitting. This one's a lot easier to, uh, to do because it's a lot shorter, so you don't have to worry quite so much about support from the tailstock end. Uh, that's pretty well finished now. I can sand it up and burnish it and put a bit of wax on. And all I've got to do now is finesse the base and part it off uh, with an undercut. So watch this space. I'm trying now just to see if I can do a little bit more. And of course I've forgotten that I've got an 18mm hole in the centre ready for it to uh, sit on top of the uh, sphere. So as if by magic, I end up with my finial in two parts. Oops, that wasn't what I'd expected. Back to the drawing board. So I've just got a tiny little scrap of ebony left over that I'm going to turn. So it's got a socket at one end to uh, sit on top of the a central bauble and a socket at the other end to uh, hold the uh, piece that I've saved uh, that was the top finial. So I've turned the little piece of wood to round, reversed it into the chuck jaws and I'm now drilling the 18mm uh, diameter hole that is the recess needed to fit the piece onto the top of the bauble. I also need the hole to be sized so that I can fit some small jaws in, in expansion mode. So what I'm doing is I'm just widening out the first sort of four or five mil into a small dovetail uh, which I can then use with my very small pen jaws. So it's now reversed and mounted in the expansion jaws with them gripping only in the first 5mm. So it's a nice secure fit with the dovetail. So I now need to drill a hole uh, that's the diameter of the uh, base of the finial that got turned off to start with. So I'm now drilling another hole through to meet the one at the bottom. I know it was going all too smoothly because at this point the flipping wood split. Um, it happens to us all. So I took it off, uh, fettled it, glued it and reshaped the tenon and got it back in the chuck and it's fine.
I just need now to finesse the recess for the uh, top finial section and then shape the base accordingly. So after a bit of fiddling with the wood getting progressively ever smaller, uh, I managed to get a bit of a sh shape that fitted the size of the base of the finial. I've now stuck this in uh, and uh, I'm just going to put some Yorkshire grit on. So that's now all gluing up uh, and I'm going to turn a central ball for mounting within the bauble. Uh, from a piece of nice olive wood and then turn a tenon for one of the smaller chucks on one end. Always good to do a bit of skew practice whenever you can. Then just time to tidy up the end. I'm going to turn down the end and put a 10 millimeter diameter uh, tenon on the end just in case I need to rechuck it in my small jaws later on. So now as this is going to be a sphere I'm just going to measure out the uh, width of the piece I'm going to cut which needs to be the same size as the hole uh, in the center of the bauble. To turn the cylinder into a sphere, it's always good practice to follow the uh, mathematics approach by cutting off the corners to the measurements that you can find on the internet. Alan Stratton demonstrates this quite a lot. Uh, it's just basically a question of working out the diameter of your cylinder and uh, measuring up the corners and uh, to the right dimensions as per that sketch. So you mark out the corners and cut them off at 45 degrees. Uh, they are about 29% of the diameter away from the edge. And then uh, you mark up uh, about 11% of the diameter, uh, a mark on either side of the corners that you've created on those little hexagon edges. And then you do it again. And those uh, cuts will again be on the tangent point on the sphere. And then when you've done that, it's just a question of blending in uh, across the, uh, the piece to create something vaguely sphere-like. So now I've got the ball, my aim is to drill a series of holes in it using the indexing on the lathe and making use of my homemade um, jig for putting in the uh, tool post banjo, which uh, houses the collets that you can get from Axminster which are drill guides which allows you to then just uh, drill holes through at dead centre uh, on your uh, workpiece. The dimensions of the jig uh, will obviously depend upon the height above the lathe bed of your um, actual lathe. Uh, what I did do and you saw earlier on there was I put a, an aluminium uh, sleeve across the uh, post at the bottom uh, which was just a scrap from a um, blind. It just means that when you screw in the um, banjo screw thread uh, gripper that you don't ruin the wood every single time. Anyway you can see here what I'm doing. I'm just using I think it's a four or five millimeter diameter drill uh, with a brad point. Uh, just drilling holes through to the middle uh, at the uh, indexing points. Um, and um, going on around doing them at uh, regular intervals. Now the Axminster indexing system on the 1628 is a bit of a pain as that picture shows you're supposed to align the red mark uh, against the index point on your lathe and then put in the locking pin but the red mark is so far away that it's very easy to actually miss the alignment by one index point which I've successfully managed to do. Uh, so all that I've done here is I've bent a, a, a nail, um, cut the head off and then epoxied it onto the red mark. 
save me the cost and hassle of buying an indexing plate or making something for the chuck. Uh, cost exactly zero and it works super accurately. So I've gone round drilling holes at regular intervals uh, all the way around it uh, and what I want to do now is uh, turn the jig so that it's at 45 degrees uh, which I'm going to do by using a protractor uh, against the banjo uh, and the lathe bed uh, just to try and get it moderately uh, accurately the same and I'm going to do the same on one side go all the way around and then repeat on the other side. Well that stage had gone quite well so I thought right okay I'll now fill in the gaps at the alternate points on the index. So uh, I thought right well I'll set it up at like 22 and a half degrees off the vertical and uh, choose a slightly smaller drill hole, uh, drill size I think it's 4mm and uh, drill around filling in the gaps. So once I've done that side I obviously then moved on to the other side and um, drill the holes there and it was all going swimmingly for a while. Isn't it always the way just one cut too many? Uh, well the ball crumbled. Uh, I'd obviously uh, not gauged any slight faults in the wood and uh, I'd uh, basically drilled it into Swiss cheese. So time for a design change. So out with the Dremel and time to reshape the centre and make some sort of pleasant shape out of it. The emerging idea now is to make it so it's like a half shell and uh, perhaps install something else in the middle as well. So I use several different burrs uh, going down in size to get it nice and smooth and creating a shape that I thought might look quite, uh, quite fun sitting in the inside of the bauble. So with that done, uh, a bit of chestnut sanding sealer and then out with the uh, paints. So I've got some Inca Gold Blue which I thought I'd put on the inside and perhaps through the holes and then uh, I'll try some Inca Gold colour, a goldy colour around the edge just to highlight it. Having put some sealer on first, it does mean that if any of the paint goes in places that you don't want, you've got um, a greater chance of getting it off. A bit of light sanding or a bit of solvent uh, will uh, remove it, uh, as happened here, because it did go in places it didn't intend it to, but it came off quite easily afterwards. So with the painting done, uh, I'm now thinking, right, OK, I'm going to hot melt glue a marble inside. So. Uh, it was more by luck than judgment that in my selection of marbles from when I was a kid, I've still got some. So in it went, a bit of hot melt glue and a bit of thick um, CA glue. Now, uh, obviously as that's glued in there, I can't spin the lathe anymore. So um, just in case it came flying out and zonked me on the head. So I'm just measuring it up now uh, to make sure that I've got exactly the right dimension so that I can pop it in to the inside of the um, bauble uh, because it does require just a little one millimetre flat on either side of the sphere to make it fit perfectly. Okay, so that's now been cut and the bottom, you can glue that in the middle. All right, I've got this scrap of uh, beach and I'm going to um, turn it between centres make it into a cone and then slice the bottom off at an angle uh, so that I can then put a coat hanger in top and hopefully suspend the sphere from there. We'll um, see how it goes then. Spin the roughing gouge for most of it obviously and then uh, shape it with the skew to get a nice smooth finish and a decent profile.
So after that was smoothed and finished, uh, I just then uh, cut it off at an angle uh, with uh, a saw and uh, jobs are good. So there we have it, the finished item. So what do you think? I think actually having the disaster with the centre falling apart has given me a nice creative opportunity to do something a bit different. The close-ups show that the fit of the finial at the top to the top of the bauble isn't very good. That's the one bit I'm not very happy with. Didn't manage to get that undercut in exactly the right um, angle. But that's the trouble with doing a retrofit. And obviously, if I'd planned exactly how this was going to work from the very beginning, I'd have probably made it all in quite a different way. So, maybe the second one would be even better. <laughs>